You know, we're, we're looking forward as we finish up our message series today, Life Lessons from Jesus. Next week, we're starting a new series called Moving Beyond Good Intentions. You know, so often in our life and in our journey, we have a lot of things that we say we want to do. Maybe I want to read the Bible more. I want to get into a group or I want to do this or I want to do that. And so often all those things just remain as that intentions. They never move beyond that to, to action steps in our life. So I'm inviting you and bring a friend with you to join us in our journey through September as we walk through moving beyond good intentions, things that are saying I'm going to do, about how we can make it happen in our life and in our habits. And I really want to invite you on Sunday, September 11th, that's in two weeks, we're going to be really f- focusing on community that day. It's going to be a wonderful day. We're going to have a couple food trucks here as well throughout the morning. And we would just like to invite you. And maybe you know someone in your line of sight who through the past couple of years kind of drifted away from church. Why don't you use this as an opportunity to invite them to come with you back to Impact? Who might that be that you can say, hey, come join me. It's going to be a great day. Um, Just focus on community and and we're going to have food trucks and just enjoy the morning together. Let's pack out that Sunday and just uh, see what God wants to do as we begin this journey moving beyond good intentions. But let's pray together as we begin our message today. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for all the good things you've done. Lord, the way that you move through us and all around us, Lord, is truly amazing. And right now, I know we all came into this place with a bunch of stuff in our life. Some stuff is good. Some stuff, quite honestly, has not been that great. But whatever that stuff is, may we just lay it at your feet. And today, may we experience you. And may we hear you. And may we walk with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You know, in our lives today, we're overwhelmed with information. And there is a difference between being smart and being wise. I mean, a lot of us, we try to gather all, all the information so that we can be smart. But smart is just having a bunch of knowledge. It's like living life as a Jeopardy contestant. You know, it's these people who have all these crazy facts in their head. And I watch that show and I just wonder, how do you know that? And why do you know that? Maybe you win a million bucks on Jeopardy. But, you know, so often in our life, we try to be smart, but that's not our ultimate goal. Wisdom is the application of what you know. It's about applying what you know into your life. It's not so much gathering all of the information. It's how I walk with the, with the smarts that I have. Because we are in an age of information overload. We are just bombarded today with information all over the place. From our fingertips to the TV to everywhere. We are just overwhelmed and bombarded with so many different voices. From Siri to Google to Alexa to all the know-it-alls on Facebook. We are just overwhelmed with information and opinions. And before you know it, we're just stuffed and overwhelmed and overwhelmed and overwhelmed with a bunch of information. And I think navigating through all these voices is one of the biggest challenges we face today. How do I navigate through all this to try to figure out what is truth and what is right and what steps I'm supposed to take? Do you guys remember back in the year 2012, there was a State Farm commercial that became fairly popular. This State Farm commercial was a State Farm employee was standing on the street talking to this young lady, showing her the new State Farm app. And she was starting to share with the State Farm agent all this wisdom that she had. And oftentimes it was wisdom that was, boy, that's, you're off your rock. Where in the world did you hear that? And she would say, well, it was on the internet. Everything on the internet's true. You know, and she would kept saying that over and over again. And then she said, oh, I got to go because I'm going on a date. I met this guy on the internet. He's a French model. And this husky guy comes walking up and the state of farm agent says, French model, huh? And the guy goes, uh, bonjour. You know? <laughs> and we, wa- we watched that commercial. And if you're like me back in 2012, you're thinking, that is ridiculous. That is absurd. I mean, that, that people would go that length. I mean, it was a fun parody, but that's just crazy. But then here we are 10 years later. And in many ways, we're living out that commercial. I can't tell you how often I hear it. 
boy, Bill, did you hear? I mean, what's going on with this world? It's crazy. I mean, it's all over YouTube. I mean, it's all over YouTube, so it has to be true, right? Or I read about it on Reddit. I saw the comments on Reddit, and I mean, all these people are saying it, so it must be accurate, right? In so many ways, we become that commercial. And I'm talking about me, too. I'm just as guilty, guys. We all have fallen prey to that. With all the voices, all the information overload, everywhere we turn, we're overwhelmed with all this information, and we try to navigate through it. So how are we navigating all the voices? How are you navigating all the voices that's going on all around you all the time, every day of your life? What is the barometer of truth? I mean, realistically, what is the barometer of truth? Unfortunately, in so many ways, truth has become dictated by what feels right for us, by what is the popular opinion or what sounds good based upon what matches my preconceived opinions that I had already. And then we base that upon ourselves as truth. And in many ways, truth has become more of a ricochet off all the noise, all the voices in our life, rather than an anchor that keeps us grounded. And there's a big difference between the two. You know, the ricochet of off all the voices around us and all the noise and all the information that's going all crazy around us, that can't be the barometer of truth. Because truth does not change. Truth does not change. How do we know this? It's proven. It's proven in the laws of mathematics. It's proven in physics. And it's proven in the laws of creation. There are certain things in all those areas that must remain consistent as truth. Otherwise, your, your math, your physics, your, your laws of creation does not line up. And God says, based upon his creation... We know what is truth. We know what is, the, we can understand the invisible qualities. So what's our barometer of truth? What is our anchor? You know, pilots, in their training time, they go through different levels of experience and training and qualifications. Younger pilots, less experienced pilots, have to fly based upon what's called the visual flight rules or VFR. What that is, is you can fly based upon the environment of what you see with your own eyes. So you can fly based upon that. But the problem is, those pilots can only fly in certain conditions. When the weather gets foggy or hazy or when storms come, they are unable to. Why? Because the fog gets so overwhelming that it makes it difficult for them to see. They can no longer trust what they see. They need to trust the equipment. And the equipment tells them that there are certain things based upon the horizon and the, horizon and the, and the uh, circumstances around the plane that do not change. And so if they can use their equipment properly, they can trust their equipment that's based upon certain factors in the environment that is consistent. But the problem is, so many pilots have gotten themselves in trouble over the years because they became disoriented in the air because they trusted their eyes. They can sometimes deceive us when the horizon and when the climate and when the, when the conditions around them changed. And I fear that in some ways, we've gained so much information we're just bombarded with information all around us. We live smart. We think we got it all. That we think we can navigate this world on our own based upon what we see with our eyes and what we feel with our hearts. And then before you know it, like a pilot with a storm on the horizon, we find ourselves in trouble when the weather changes when the storm of life comes. Because this world is a, is a hazy kind of a place. And navigating based on what we see leads us to walk through life 
in a state of spiritual and emotional disorientation. And I fear so many of us, and myself included so many times in my life, I found myself walking in complete disorientation, spiritually and emotionally, because I was trusting what I saw or trusting what I felt and being ricocheted off of everything going on around me rather than an anchor to guide me. What information are you using to build your foundation? What are you using? Because we all tend to make life decisions based upon the information that's immediately around us. And God created us as relational beings. That's how he hardwired us. Which means every relationship you've ever had, every choice you've ever made, every experience in your life is a building block in the foundation of who you are. Every relationship, every choice, every experience affects future relationships and experiences and choices. Because it builds up our foundation and then before you know it, how you view what is going on around you, how you interpret your experiences or what you're feeling is based upon your foundation, what you've built up based upon your relationships, your choices, and your experiences. And we really need to be focused on our foundation. And as Jesus was concluding his Sermon on the Mount, that's what he circled back around to. Building a solid foundation. Matthew 7, 24, Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You see, Jesus is highlighting here, our goal is not to be smart. He was talking to a whole bunch of religious leaders who were pretty smart. They had all the information, but they weren't walking wise. They didn't have that solid foundation. Just having a ton of information, being book smart, doesn't give us a strong foundation. It doesn't make us wise. See, Jesus highlighted in this verse what I like to call the wisdom equation. Jesus showed us here that hearing plus action equals wisdom. You want to find wisdom in your life, you need to hear it, you need to apply it, and you need to live it. And there you find wisdom. Because wisdom is the application of knowledge. It's not just being smart and having knowledge. It's not being a know-it-all. Jesus says to be wise, you need to hear his words. Spend time in his word. Being here on Sunday is a great place to start to hear the message, but then also have a daily encounter each week where you're digging into God's word. But we can't just stop there. We can't just stop there and say, wow, Bill, that was a great message. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. We can't just read the Bible and say, wow, that was a great passage. That was an amazing story. I loved it. If all we do is read it or hear it and then go on with our life, we've missed it. And that's what Jesus was saying all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, which led up to this point. It's not just about hearing. Jesus says you need to hear my words and then put them into practice. If we are not living out what he's teaching us in his biblical principles, we're missing the opportunity to experience him fully and what he wants to do in our life. And quite honestly, we become weakened when the storms come. This is so important because we're going to face storms. Some of you might be sitting here today and you're in a good season of life. Life is good, works well, kids are doing good, everybody's healthy, everything's wonderful. And I'm glad to hear that, but I promise you something. The Bible says storms will come. They will come. The condition of this world will not always be clear. And so in that mindset, we need to know just like a pilot in the air, we cannot always be up there trusting what we see. We need to trust the equipment. And the same is true in our life. We can't just walk around, walking through this world, walking through our life, trusting what I see with my eyes or see with my heart. There needs to be an anchor because the more we live out our life based upon our own smartness, the more we set ourselves up to walk in spiritual and emotional disorientation. But the more we engage Jesus and put biblical guidelines and principles into our life, into practice, the more we are strengthened to navigate in this world, especially when the storms come. Jesus continued to explain it this way in verse 25 through 27. 
He said, the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not pull, put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. What are you using to build your foundation? In this passage, Jesus said you have two options. The sand which highlights the more convenient, more popular, more readily available resources, what seems to be right. It's right there, so why not use it? Or the rock. Quite honestly, the rock takes a little bit more effort to find and to retrieve. It's not as plentiful, but so much more reliable. So much more reliable. Because Jesus promised storms, will come. I know we like to think when we come to God, hey God, like the good life equals I don't have any problems in my life, right? And over and over again, Jesus highlights, uh uh-uh, storms will come. It's a matter of what is your foundation in. You know, when I read that with this passage, when I read Jesus' words, I think about the house built on the sand and the house built on the rock. I bet when the weather was good, those houses were HGTV quality. They were amazing. They probably looked pristine and beautiful. I mean, it'd be hard to choose which house you want to take, how amazing they looked. I mean, the sand house probably had these nice little sculptures all around it. I mean, it's like, boy, that house is amazing. But the problem with the house was not when the weather was good. The problem was how well the house was built when the weather turned, and when the weather was not so good. And I think we have a tendency to walk a little too confident. Sometimes we walk a little bit too confident in the good weather times. We think, hey, I got this. Everything's good. I mean, life is good. Life is perfect. Everybody's healthy. Job's going good. I mean, I'm just enjoying life. But what this happens and creates is a false sense of security. That everything is okay. And that we think we're good. But you know what? The Bible identifies the devil as a lion. Hiding in the high weeds. Waiting to jump on its prey. And you know when the lion attacks its prey? It's when they're out in the open. When they think, everything's good. I'm okay. You see... In the moment when we begin to think, I've got this, I am okay, you better be careful because the devil's coming. The devil is coming. And he wants to manipulate you and pull you down and to, and to deceive you and to attack you. To pull you away from God. When we begin to think we're okay, he's got us. Because when the storms come, we quickly realize I'm not okay. I don't got this. I'm not as strong as I thought I was. Because our ability to stand firm through the storm cannot come through our own foundation, through our own ability to see with our eyes and our heart. It comes through a solid foundation that's brought upon hearing God's word and living out those biblical principles in our life. Our ability to stand firm comes through that as we navigate this world on our own standards, we will fall. We will get beaten up. We will ricochet off all over the place. But if we find ourselves on a foundation built on God's principles and God's word, we find ourselves with strength even when the storms come. But the problem is, so often in our lives, when we're just kind of drifting through this world, going on our own feelings, our own what we see with our own VFRs, what happens is we develop these habits. And we all develop habits. Whether you intend to or you just drift into them, we are all creatures of habits. And if you're not intentional about the habits you're developing, I promise you you're drifting into bad habits in your life in some way. And it happens spiritually and emotionally as well. And many of us, well, probably all of us, have some level of 
not so great habits in our life. Let's just be honest, we all do, right? They just happen. But in order to find that solid foundation to put things into practice, we need to put God's word into practice and it involves the development of new habits. And in order to do this, it takes focus and it takes some discipline. Whenever you wanna do anything in your life to create new habits, whether it's eating different, exercising, studying, um, you, know, you name it, it takes focus and it takes discipline. The same is true in our spiritual journey. Why? Because we get so focused on following ourselves and following our own pattern. Jesus put it this way in Matthew, earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. He said, enter through the narrow gate. For the wide gate and broad, I'm sorry, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. What Jesus is saying here is the broad road that leads to the wide gate, that's the popular choice. That's the easy one to get to. That's where all the crowd tends to go. It's where, hey, everybody's going this way. Let's just go this way. It looks good. It seems right. It feels right. But when the storms come, this gate leads to destruction. And then Jesus said the narrow gate is the road less traveled. It's not the popular option. In fact, a lot of us look at that road less traveled, the path of following Jesus, applying his biblical principles to our life. If we're honest with ourselves, we tend to look at that and say, it doesn't look as nice. It doesn't look as appealing. It doesn't look as fun. I want to be happy. I want to enjoy life. And that just seems like more of a drag. And it seems like if I go that way, I mean, I want to be kind of, everybody else is going a different way. Why don't I just go with where everybody else is walking? Seems easier. Seems more natural. And then what happens as we go down that path, what Jesus highlights in this passage is we tend to tr not travel down that way because we don't quite see the value in it. It's like, well, I mean, that path seems a little bit more difficult, a little bit more effort, not as glamorous as this path where everybody's walking. And I don't really see the point. And then before you know it, we begin to devalue things. And Satan begins to manipulate our thoughts in that way. Well, maybe, maybe heaven's not everything it's cracked up to be. Maybe it's not as great as we thought it was. I mean, I mean what's so great about heaven? And then we begin to value hell, that maybe, maybe hell's not really real. Maybe this, what we're experiencing now is hell. And then everybody just goes to heaven. And before you know it, Satan begins to manipulate our thoughts and our thinking to devalue what God provides for all eternity and how we can experience eternity now. Do you know he did that at the very beginning? When he uh, tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. That's exactly how he works. He works through manipulation. And that manipulation begins by seeing, wow, you can have everything else in this garden. But man, God's holding out on you because he's not letting you eat from that one tree. And doesn't that fruit look pretty good? And what did he say if you eat that fruit, Eve? Well, I'll know, I'll know good and evil. I'll have more knowledge. See? See, Eve, God's holding out on you. You could really enjoy life if you just ate that tree from that tree. And he began to manipulate and devalue what they had, what God was already providing to make them think what they're missing out. And he does that to us too. We think, well, that road sin seems so great. And I could really enjoy life now if I just went this way with the crowd. And we begin to value what God has for us and how we can experience eternity now, in this moment. And Jesus is saying, if we walk wise, if we put his words into action, we can experience the value of what he has for us for all eternity, and you can ex begin to experience eternity now. But my friends, understand this. We cannot compromise our commitment to Jesus by pursuing the popular path of least resistance. Please, do not compromise your commitment to Jesus to walk a path that seems easier, that seems more popular, that seems like there's less resistance. 
Because the problem, if we don't take time to develop these habits in our life, to hear God's word and to put them in practice, deception is all around us. There's voices all around us every day, information overload, and throughout all the information overload is constant deception, manipulation that the devil is squeezing in to us all the time that leads us down a path of spiritual and emotional disorientation. And that can happen so fast. Just like a pilot in the air who thinks, hey, the weather's good, everything's wonderful. The weather can turn like that and everything changes. And it happens so fast in our walk too. Life seems great, but then like Job, tomorrow we lose it all. And deception and voices are all around us. I mean, just look at it. I'm not trying to freak you out or overwhelm you, but we're so accustomed and so attached to our technology. And I'm not saying that's a horrible thing, but we need to be wise. Because if you ever study Google algorithms, I mean, all the time they're tracking us and manipulating us and deceiving us. Why? For what purpose? So they can identify what does Bill do? What does Bill like? Where does Bill go? And now I'm going to use that so that I can manipulate Bill into, you need that. Can you buy that? How about you get that now? Marketing 101. The greatest, most effective way to market is to plaster the product all over the place so that everywhere people look, all they see is that. They see that. They see that. And they make it look so good so that you get to the point in your mind, you subconsciously begin to think, man, everybody, I need that. I need that. I need the next iPhone. I need to spend another $1,000 on an iPhone because, man, they added one small little addition to their phone that I really don't need. But, man, for some reason, it makes the picture so much better. And then I need to spend another $1,000 because I need a better picture. My pictures aren't good anymore. And we justify it, don't we? I do it too, so I'm guilty. In both situations, the voices all around us are trying to get us to buy, to click, to, into their product for the one purpose, their gain. For their gain. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 7, 15. Watch out for those false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Ferocious wolves. Guys, I don't think we have to inform you on this, but we're in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Everybody is often out for their own interests and what they desire. And the wolves... I love watching National Geographic. You ever watch it? When, with the animals out there, I love watching the predators going after the prey. I'm weird, but that's, that's exciting TV to me. As they go after their prey, and wolves are smart and cunning and manipulative, and they work together, and they're going after the prey, and they're tricking their prey for one reason, to satisfy their appetite. Because they are hungry. And these wolves that Jesus is talking about are wolves that are trying to satisfy their own happiness, their own appetite. And they make the appearance of something that looks good. They're dressed as sheep's clothing. They make it seem, hey, this is good. I'm here for you. This will benefit you. This is, this is, what's, this is what you need. And please understand this in truth. In this world today, you need to understand this truth Everyone has their own priorities. And if we are not careful and walk in wisdom, what they're trying to do is make their priorities your agenda. Everywhere you go, other people are trying to make their priorities your agenda. And if we are not using the anchor of God to guide us, it's so easy to be swept away. And their priorities are driven by their appetites of their own hearts. 
It's like going to a fast food restaurant when you're hungry, right? And you look at the menu, and you see the pictures, and you look at those pictures, and you think, man, that is the best burger I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it's plump, it's juicy, look at that beautiful lettuce. I mean, it's amazing. Get me that burger. And then they bring the burger out to you, and it's this smashed up greasy thing. And you think, what's this? How they get me to this point? They went after my hunger and made me think this is what you need. Soda pop, Mountain Dew, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, you name it, energy drinks. They've learned a very important thing in marketing. And that is this. They focus all their marketing to young kids and preteens. Because they've learned that at that age, if they can get you to buy in and think, that is, that, I like this drink, they've bought a loyal customer for life. They've got you. They've learned, if I can get you young, I've got you for life. You don't believe me? Let's go out in the lobby and get some Pepsi freaks and Coke freaks and seven of them go at it. Right? We're all in that boat, aren't we? In my household, we, have, we lived in the household divide. My brother liked Pepsi because he's weird and I drank Coke. <laughs> we all fall prey to that. And what this happens because of all the information that's being overloaded and bombarded and thrown at us and overwhelmed with us everywhere we turn and everybody's trying to get us with their own agenda and their priorities that they're trying to make agenda of in our life and they're trying to manipulate us to buy into whatever they're trying to sell because they're after their own gain, not ours. And once they get us, it develops these habits in our life. They gain our heart and then before you know it, they begin to affect our behaviors. Marketing 101. And it's the same way the devil works too. It's information overload. So what are your motives? You know, what's driving you? Think about the motives of those around you. So often these things that are trying to sell us stuff or lead us in different ways... They tend to make us think, hey, I'm here for you. We're trying to be good neighbors. We're trying to be, uh, do good in this world and make a difference. But when you really get down to it, their ambition is their bottom line. Their ambition is their gain. See, make no mistake about it, my friends. Their manipulation consumes our heart and in many ways controls our behaviors. Ferocious wolves and our behaviors reveal what is in our heart Jesus said in Matthew or Luke 6 what's in our heart comes out of our life comes out of our mouth we cannot hide the reality of our heart because we portray it all the time in the choices we make in the words we use in the attitudes we have it doesn't mean that it's not perfection. Yes, we mess up sometimes. Sometimes I have a bad attitude. Okay, you ask my wife. Sometimes I have a bad attitude a lot of times. I'm trying to get better. But in the normalcy of who we are, are we pursuing Christ or pursuing my own heart? Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 16 and 17. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit. My friends, please don't overlook or neglect to be honest with this. Our world is full of false teachers with deceptive and hollow claims. They're looking to make their priorities our agenda. And if we do not have an anchor of truth to guide us, we can quickly become so spiritual and emotional disoriented in the world and fall prey to all the attacks that Satan's trying to do through all this. Just because something looks good does not mean it's good. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father. 
And the question is, do we trust it? And if so, are we willing not just to hear it, but are we willing to apply it and live it out in our life in order that we can experience true wisdom in our journey? That when the storms come, and they will, will I be strong enough to withstand it? Not because it's on my strength, but because it's within his power that I walk. And we either walk with intentions to pursue righteousness or pursue ourselves. My friends, our spiritual welfare depends on our ability to critically assess all the voices, all the information that's being thrown at us in the world and the fruits of their actions based upon the anchor of God and his word. This is so important because our eternity is truly at stake. Jesus concluded in one of his closing remarks on the Sermon on, on the Mount, he said this in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform any miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I don't know about you, but I read those words and they really make me pause and ponder. Please understand, Jesus is not saying living a perfect life. But he's saying, are we living out the will of the Father? He kind of bookended this, the Sermon on the Mount. If you recall the first message and the first thing that Jesus highlights in the Sermon on the Mount was the will of the Father. And he showcased the will of the Father is for us to pursue righteousness. Righteousness is just that fancy biblical word that means to be right before God. Am I pursuing a life to be right with God? Not perfection. Read the Bible. It was full of knuckleheads and mess-ups who got it wrong a lot. But you know what made the difference between those who experienced God's blessing and eternal and, and his life and those who did not? The ones who messed up but got, experienced God, got back up, made the right choice, and ran back to him. The world, those of us who don't do that, we struggle with getting back up and running towards our own heart. You see, God's will for us is to pursue righteousness. We need to live a lifestyle that pursues righteousness. It begins in our heart. It begins to, how do we navigate this world with all the voices? You're not going to escape the voices. You're not going to be able to drown them out. But you need to figure out how to navigate through it. Otherwise, we get easily pulled away and swept away by self-indulgent and me-first mentality that is of this world. We need to pursue Jesus and his righteousness so that we can experience his eternal rewards in our life. So how do we do that? There's three things that I think probably fall into a category that we all probably fit into one of these three areas that we can probably take as next steps from today and, and moving forward. The first step is <clears throat> asking the question, is Jesus a priority in your life? Is he a priority in your life? It's so easy to allow everything else to become the most important thing and to become the agenda of our day-to-day. -day. And the question is, where's Jesus in all that? Maybe you've given your life to Jesus, but you've kind of drifted away. You've been living your own life your own way, and you want Jesus to bless you. You want him to provide the good life, but you want it, you've been living in a way that you want it on your own terms. God, just be good to me and bless me, but let me live my life. But the Bible says that we are supposed to not deny ourselves and follow him. That he becomes our identity and who we are, not me. Maybe you kind of walking your own way and now it's time to recommit. Get back with him. Start living for him. 
Have him be a priority of your life. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I've never even given my life to Jesus. I don't even know what that means. And maybe now's the time that you need to give your life completely to him. Maybe you need to take the step to be baptized. You know, baptism is that place where we can find who we are in him and his death, his burial, and his resurrection. If that's you and you need to talk to somebody about taking that step, we'll be at the Engage Impact booth at the end of the service. We'd love to help you and talk you through and answer any questions that you may have about those next steps. Maybe some of you say, Jesus is a priority of my life, but if I'm honest, I spend time with him when I come to church or here and there during the week if I get a chance. And maybe you need to make the effort to say, I need to have a daily encounter with Jesus every day. Reading the Bible or devotion, spending time praying with him and just listening to him. And stop using the excuses of, well, I'm just too busy. I don't have the time. If Jesus, who is probably the most busiest person ever walked the face of the earth, having people all the time pulling at him and trying to get his attention, found a moment every morning to go away and pray, I think we can too. So maybe, maybe you need to make that effort. Maybe some of you who have families, you've been doing a daily encounter as an individual, but you haven't been doing family devotions. And maybe this week is the week to start family time devotions on a daily basis. Reading the Bible, devotion, praying together as a family, and watch what God does. If you need help taking that step, let us know. We would love to help provide resources to help you take that step, whether as an individual or as a family. The last thing is the community we surround ourselves with. God created us relational beings, and we need community, and we always are searching for community. The question is, who are we surrounding ourselves with? That's why here at Impact, we believe growth groups are so important. Growth groups are the smaller family within the larger family. It's a chance to really find a community, a small family, that is there for us to journey together, to support us, to be there for us when the storms come, or even when life is good. Just to love on each other and journey with Jesus together.